I will take the scripture for the foundation of this message in Matthew chapter 3 verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Now there's, I want you to notice a few things is that Jesus was baptized. If Jesus was baptized, you need to be baptized too. So for those of you who are saying, well, I got baptized as a kid, that's what matters. Jesus in here was 30 years of age. The little baptism when you were a kid is great, but the real baptism, biblical baptism is when you make a decision to be baptized. Can somebody say amen? We also see here that Jesus came up from the water. When you were a baby and you got baptized, they sprinkled you with water. The kind of baptism Jesus expects from us is when you get fully dunked and immersed in the water. Amen. And so Jesus came out from the water and behold the heavens were open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove alighting upon him and suddenly a voice from heaven came saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want you to notice that God gave Jesus approval. God gave Jesus already words of affirmation before Jesus did anything on this earth for his ministry yet. This is an example for all the fathers here as well that your kids need your affirmation and they need your approval not after they bring A's from school, not after they bring trophies from their sports but before they do all of that because that affirmation is the fuel to succeed in life. Can somebody say amen? We have to understand as Christians is God wants to give us his love. God wants to give us his information before we go do anything in our life because that becomes the foundation for our success in life. Can I get a witness in this place this morning? I want you to notice that the love of the Father is the foundation upon which the Holy Spirit descends. Write this down. The Holy Spirit rests on the revelation of the fatherhood of God. The Holy Spirit descended when the revelation that God's love, the love of the Father was revealed, made verbal, made real. It wasn't the love that God had in his heart. It was the love that God expressed out of his heart. Because see, if you know, if God the Father loves you, it's great. But it's when you know that he loves you. This is where the Holy Spirit comes and begins to rest on your life. It's good to live a life of prayer. It's important to live a life of fasting. It's even more important to stay away from sin, stay away from the devil and stay away from the world and curses. But all of that doesn't draw the Holy Spirit in your life as much as your reception of the Father's love for you. And you don't wait until you accomplish things, until you fast 40 days, cast out devils, die to your selfishness and then the Father loves you. The Father loves you before that, it gives you the power to live a holy and a godly life. Somebody say amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Everyone needs three fathers in their life. The first one is the Heavenly Father. People must know that God in heaven to them is a father. He didn't reveal himself as a father in the Old Testament. He only gave clues to David where he said, I am the father to the fatherless. Where he said to Isaiah, that Jesus will become the everlasting father but when Jesus comes on this earth he reveals that God is our father he says when you pray pray like this our father I want you to notice word our indicates we can't just come to God the father on our own we have to be connected in a community you can't just simply isolate yourself from the church, isolate yourself from brothers and believers and say, well, I'm the child of God. That's not how this works. The fact that God is your father indicates the person sitting next to you is your brother and your sister. Come on, somebody. Our father. Our father who is in heaven. That means Jesus revealed to us that God in heaven is our dad. In Romans it says that we don't just call him dad, we don't just call him God, we call him Abba which is another word, it's a very tender word in Aramaic which just says Papa, Daddy. It's a very affectionate word of a little child that calls her father her dad. I remember a young man, actually a little older than me but to me everybody's young. Ever since I turned 30 everybody's young. Until 30 I saw old people and young people, now it's everybody young. This gentleman comes to me and he says, Vlad, uh, he says, I committed a sin. Do you think that I lost my salvation? 
you know, I've repented of it. Do you think that uh, God, you know, no longer wants to do anything with me? And I asked him if he has any daughters or sons. He says, yes, I have two daughters. And I said, let me ask you a question. Have they made mistakes? He said, yes. I said, have you disowned them because they made mistakes? He says, never. And I said, you're a horrible father. He looked at me, he said, how did you know that? <laughs> I was like, the Bible says that compared to God, we're horrible. And I said, you see God as a judge. You don't see him as a father. I said, when you have a revelation of who God is as a father, it changes the way you pray. It changes the way you live. It changes the way you read the Bible. It changes the way you pray. Because see, if you see God as a judge and you fall asleep in a prayer, you judge yourself. But if you see God as a father and you fall asleep in yourself, you feel good about yourself. Because kids never feel bad by falling asleep in their dad's arms. God is your father. Can somebody say amen? That is a revelation that you have to get. I can explain to you. I can draw pictures to you. But until the Holy Spirit takes this information and turns it into revelation, it will just be empty information. But God loves you more than you ever imagined. God is madly in love with you. The second father that we all probably have met or need to meet in our life is our biological father. Biological father. And this is where things get a little bit tense. This is where things get a little bit painful for some of us because some of us don't have a biological father. Maybe he died when you were young. Maybe he abandoned you. Maybe he disowned you. Maybe you have a biological father, but he just doesn't want to talk to you. There was a lady who comes to our church and the biological father disowned her. Says, you're not my daughter, even though DNA proved that he was his daughter. And at first it seemed nothing. She's like, oh, I don't care. Get lost. But then it started to sip, sip in inside of her. It started to create hurt and, and, and offenses in her heart. I want to tell you something that if you've been hurt, by the absentee of your parents. Maybe you've been abused by your parents. Maybe you've been neglected, never felt loved. I want to tell you something here today that God loves you and His love will make up for the absence of the love that you've experienced from your earthly parents. And I want to tell you something that most of the earthly parents try their best some of them the reason why they act the way they act is because they're fighting their own battles and because they actually have experienced exactly the same thing from their own fathers and their own mothers they don't they don't do things unintentionally it's just they're battling with their own stuff and that's why we have to understand is that God used your parents to bring you into this world but your father lives in heaven he loves you unconditionally and don't be mad and don't be angry at your earthly father if he didn't do what he was supposed to do maybe one day God will give you the grace to do it right to your own kids you know when I struggled even with this issue of fatherhood and though my dad is an incredible dad he's an amazing father but you know you grow up and craving words of affirmation you grow up craving I'm proud of you and sometimes because we're all different as kids you don't get those words and you can do all things right and you still can feel that in your heart and you know you can cover it with the fact that you know he doesn't hate me he doesn't beat me he doesn't know he didn't try to sell me on ebay or anything like that and stuff so but at the end you crave that affection you crave that 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 affirmation and and if your dad is like ukrainian or russian or or you know we're guys are just a little bit less huggy less affectionate you know they're like i brought you into this world i provide the roof over your house shut up brother <laughs> you know i can take you out if you keep complaining <laughs> and stuff and so and when, when i got married i had this situation where me and my wife went to japanese restaurant and uh i grew up uh with olive garden appetizers well, the word appetizer to me is something that could fill you completely because you know Olive Garden appetizers you can feed your whole family tree with that one salad because it keeps coming every single five minutes and then after you ate the salad you're like no I don't want the meal I don't want the sweets another salad please so but if you go to some of these Japanese restaurants or these sushi places they don't bring you a huge bowl of appetizer they bring you this big bowl and you, your heart gets excited until you sneak in inside and you find out they picked six leaves from the backyard and sprayed something little drops on it it looks amazing on Instagram but it doesn't satisfy your appetite the first time I saw that I was angry I looked at my wife and I said this is why I don't like sushi I love me some Olive Garden because I go in go in there and the appetizers make me full but see you have to understand one thing about appetizers they're never meant to make you satisfied they're meant to wet your appetite for the real meal that's coming see your parents God sent your parents as an appetizer of his love 
not to make you satisfied but to make you wet your appetite for his love and some of your parents they are like olive garden appetizer oh smooshy lovey dovey emojis every day gifts amazing and you're like man i almost don't need the love of god because they love me so much that is awesome but some of our parents are japanese <laughs> You get just a little bit and you're like man I want some more and then you're holding that dad and mom responsible like man give me some more give me some more but they ain't gotten anything more this is where you have to understand God sent your mom and your dad not to replace God but to prepare you and make you hungry for God somebody give God a praise right now hallelujah and I'm gonna tell you something if you begin to thank your father, thank your mother for what you already received from them, even if it's six leaves sprayed with a little sauce and you say it's preparing me to see God like never before. See because I received less I hunger more for God. The secret of my hunger is I didn't get everything from everybody and it's okay. They're not God. They're not eternal. They can't be there for me all the time. I use what they got. They quicken something inside of me that I pursue God now and I say God I expect so much more. I expect less out of them and more out of you because see, some of you, you do the opposite. You expect everything out of them and expect nothing out of God. Today a switch has to happen. Come on somebody. There is so much. There is so much that God has for you but you're too busy trying to squeeze stuff out of your parents. Whatever they gave you, receive that. If they gave you no appetizer at all, there is an entree that's coming. And there is sweets that's coming after that. That chocolate cake. Listen, that, that thing is coming. It's going to make you spiritually so blessed and full in Jesus' name. A lot of men and women who make great difference in this world, they stepped over the fact that they didn't receive certain things from biological fathers and mothers. The best fathers in this room will still not going to be what God can be. Can I give you something? God doesn't attach a blessing to your life based on the quality of a father you had. He attaches a blessing to your life based on the quality of your attitude to the father you have. God says out of 10 commandments only one commandment where he says I will give you a long and good life based not if you had a good dad, if you had a good respect toward your dad your dad might have not been there he might have not been perfect you might have still things battling with because of what was happened but if you have a good attitude if you say i didn't choose this situation but i choose my reaction god says i'll bless you i will pour out the windows of heaven and i pour blessing on you and people will look at you but you didn't come from the right family yeah but i had a right attitude come on somebody hallelujah thank you jesus the third father the third father everyone needs is the spiritual father and the spiritual father is is like a coach and maybe you're here today and you have a person that your physical father your biological father wasn't there but probably somebody took in the role maybe your uncle maybe your stepdad maybe a coach maybe a teacher a pastor a mentor somebody who came in and took the role and fathered you and helped you we call them spiritual fathers sometimes they can be younger than you sometimes they can be older than you sometimes God will father you through a spiritual father who you actually even never met he will use different people in your life what I want to encourage you with today is this just because you didn't have maybe a perfect relationship with your biological father God can still take you to your destiny if you allow someone else to come who probably is already in your life and allow them to speak into your life father you mentor you, correct you sometimes and give you affirmation in your life and don't just walk around and say you know what my, my, my dad my, my this and that no no receive what God has given you Come on. the word coach comes from the original word where it's something or someone that carries a valuable person or a valuable thing from one place to another and if you see it the picture behind me it, this is what coach is it's it's like an uber it's like a it's like taxi if you want to go from point a to point b in life if you want to go from a bad marriage to a great marriage you need a spiritual father you need somebody who can help you there you if you need to you need if you want to go from poverty to prosperity you need somebody who will take you there 
I'm thankful to God that God has given each one of us those people. Now, can I give a little uh, side note? It's important that you don't just call somebody your mentor, but you actually follow through with what they advise you with. We live in the generation today, it's become sexy. It's become popular to post my mentor. He is my mentor. She is my mentor, but they don't do nothing. Now, I love the idea of having a mentor. That is great. Instead of posting that you have a mentor, let your life confirm you have a mentor. Let's imagine that you walk into the gym and you're slightly overweight, let's say, and you, you got a great fitness trainer. One of those guys that goes buff, I mean muscles everywhere. And so you come in and you stand up and they are your trainer. You take a picture, a poster online everywhere my trainer <laughs> now that is great the only difference is the trainer is fit and you're fat so instead of saying that's your trainer maybe hold off with the pictures that that's your trainer get on the meal plan that your trainer put you on start doing those wraps stop eating those twinkies after 9 p.m stop hiding little sneakers under your bed and stop doing all of this stuff and live your life as the trainer puts you on versus constantly walking around she is my mentor we're getting mentored by that really because if you would have been mentored you wouldn't be in this situation right now because a mentor transports you from point a to point b you're stuck and so i want to encourage you that you know people sometimes look you don't see me posting every other week but even when my pastor speaks my mentor but everybody who sees my life they know one thing he didn't make it on his own there there was somebody who held him there, somebody who took him there. Because I focus more on obedience to my mentor versus showing off my mentor. Let my life bring an example that I have a mentor in my life who guides me, believes in me, speaks to me, sometimes corrects me and tells me to lose weight. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to bring this message to an end by sharing five stages of development of a man. And so this will apply to women, but today, ladies, you get a free pass. Just sit and find ways to criticize your husband. I have a feeling a few times during the service, you're going to go like this, and uh, it's completely fine. Um, and so men did not know that today you're coming to church to get a little bit encouraged. <laughs> but we love the men, amen, and stuff. So we want to share a little bit. So the first stage, I want us to write this down, is the development of men. The first stage is we are born male we are born male you might say well it's obvious uh not no more we live in a generation where you can choose whether you're male or not and i want to be respectful to people who are maybe struggling with that and have actually con like confusion in their mind and maybe fighting and, and hurting inside and not sure about their identity and their gender and everything and i don't want to throw these general slogans that people like to do behind the pulpit and not actually knowing people who struggle with that but the word of god tells us that god made them male and female which means that being a male is not your decision it's your discovery you don't decide to be a male you only discover that you are one you may say how do we discover that you go into the restroom and you discover <laughs> so you are born a male that's very important number two is you become a boy after that a boy is a selfish kid a boy you may say what is the difference between a boy and a man well we're gonna see right now a boy is someone who is passive a man is assertive Come on now. a boy lives for a moment typically for the weekend a man plans for the future a boy looks for a girlfriend man looks for a wife Hallelujah. a boy loves to speak man acts a boy is possessive and controlling a man is protective a boy plays games a man shoulders responsibility a boy tells others he's a man a man quietly lives it a boy makes excuses man makes progress a boy makes demands a man serves other people 
A boy lies and cheats and deceives, but a man tells the truth. His word is his bond. Even if it hurts him, even if it embarrasses him, even if it makes him feel bad, a man knows one thing. His value and worth is never determined by his gifts. It's not determined by his talent. His money is determined by his integrity. And your integrity is as good as your honesty. When you are a boy, people are fed up with you. When you are a man, people are fed by you. A boy is somebody who lives in the flesh, is guided by the flesh. You can be 24 and be a boy. You can be 40 and be a boy. Or you can be 12 and be a boy. But there's one characteristic about boys is people that are close to them that know them. Not those that see them on Instagram and Facebook and see them from a distance. But people that know them typically are fed up with them. They're fed up with their lies. They're fed up with them playing games. They're fed up with them not being consistent. They're fed up with their laziness. They're fed up with their addiction to the remote control. They're fed up with them being on their phone. They're fed up with them not reading the Bible, not praying. They're fed up with them not following God, not leading the family. They're always fed up. But a man, a real man, he is led by the Spirit of God, which means that he develops a fruit of the Spirit. What does the fruit does? Feeds other people. Now, this man may impress the world, but his family is fed by him. A boy impresses the world, but he can never impress his family because see, your family is not impressed by your games. People that know you, close friends, they're not impressed by your skills or your gifts. They're only fed by your character or fed up by lack of it. Come on, somebody. This is not a good time to look at your husband. Not a good time to look at your husband. I see some wives. Not a good time to do that. It's a Father's Day. (laughs) Number three. We grow to become a man. So we go from a boyhood to becoming a man. I want you to write this down. You're a male by birth. You're a man by choice. You're not born a man. You become a man. You don't become a man because you pass through puberty. You don't become a man because you can make a woman pregnant. You don't become a man because you got a muscle car. And you don't become a man because you got muscles. You don't become a man because you got a bachelor's degree. You don't become a man because you got a house. And you don't become a man because you got awards and trophies. You don't become a man because people call you a man. You don't become a man because you got a mustache. You don't become a man because you started to shave. What what makes a man? There's one word that makes a man. Maturity. I know word maturity is used as a qualification to watch R-rated films. Are you mature? For mature only. Meaning you can consume junk. In the biblical definition of maturity, maturity is not your ability to consume alcohol, smoke, or watch porn. Biblical definition of maturity is something different than that because maturity is not age. Maturity is not academics. Maturity is not accomplishments and maturity is not appearance. It's an attitude that you possess toward the things in life, toward yourself, toward people around you, toward your mistakes, toward your successes. Your maturity is always determined by your attitude. If you made a mistake, I wasn't sure whether to go or not. And we see that in Adam. God gives him a word. You have to do this. And Adam goes into boyhood instead of manhood instead of leading his wife away from sin and instead of killing the snake adam sees his wife who has a weak moment gets deceived by the by the snake and adam stood there and the bible says she, adam stood beside her when the snake was doing the conversation and eve is giving him that fruit adam was not deceived like eve was so adam had a choice to help his wife says hey honey um not a good time to talk to snakes put that apple back let's go back let, let me get you some mangoes and some other fruits they're much better adam st- stood there instead of being a warrior he's a wimp instead of being aggressive against the enemy he is passive instead of pursuing god he just kind of stands there Uh, you want me to eat the apple okay i'll eat the apple he eats the apple and you see adam is a boy he's not leading a woman to christ he's now blaming a woman because when god comes and says who did this not me her anytime a man doesn't follow christ is where boyhood begins 
when you ignore your consciousness as a man the consciousness screams and says don't and you begin to silence it you silence the holy spirit he can't produce a character if he's ignored you slip into the flesh when adam slipped into the flesh something happened is the boyhood begins to be maximized that adam now doesn't take responsibility for his junk he blames it on somebody else blames it on eve and eve of course she blames it on the snake and da 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 and god begins to bring discipline on adam why because adam didn't mature see your sin is not the problem it's the fact how you deal with your sin that's the problem temptation is not the problem being attacked is not the problem being assaulted is not the problem it's how you respond to it when the holy spirit convicts you do you silence that or do you say yes holy spirit because your character is developed by the voices you obey do you obey the holy spirit or you obey the voice of the flesh do you obey the holy spirit or you do obey the voice of people a real man knows i respect you thank you but god says no I can't do that if you want to do that that's your choice but I am not going to do that why because I obey God I love you honey but before I met you I gave my life to someone who created you who created me and when I die I'm gonna stand naked not in front of you in front of him so I live my life for the opinion of one and your character is developed when you live like that Come on, somebody. Number four, when we get married, we get married, become a husband. Marriage makes you a husband. Maturity makes you a great husband. When you get married, you become a husband. But when you are mature, you become a husband good to live with. A husband that a wife thanks God for. A husband that the girlfriends say, man, you got a great husband. And it's not because she posts uh, pictures of roses that you give once in eight months. Um, but it's actually because it's evident that you make your wife happy. The problem that happens is when a boy skips the manhood stage and thinks that just because he got a thing between his legs, he's ready to be a husband. You're still a boy that needs to grow to become a man. And when you're a man means when you're mature, when you learn to deal with your stuff, when you learn honesty, when you learn to take responsibility, when you learn the character, when you learn to follow the Holy Spirit instead of following your flesh and you become a man, something happens. Now you're ready for one more challenge because becoming a man was hard. Wait until you get a woman. It will take you to another level. Because see, your standard is not your dad. Your standard is Jesus Christ. And you look at Jesus and Jesus doesn't play by these rules. You don't like me i don't like you too you didn't satisfy me you didn't please me well <laughs> watch me that's not how jesus left the example he came to the church and the church was at its worst and jesus was at his best and jesus never dumped us never left us never said a bad word never beat us never accused us jesus was the great husband continues to be there's one thing about jesus he's consistent we go like this whew, whew, whew. kind of like women sometimes <laughs> Jesus have mercy. <laughs> Women have roller coasters. Now men, men have roller coasters too, I understand. But there's one thing that men lack today is men are just like that, the roller coasters. A wife didn't give gave me an attitude, a wife didn't give me this, a wife did this, and that's it. I'm not gonna treat her well. And see, maturity in marriage requires your consistency in love toward your woman. However she behaves, no matter how many credit cards she maxed out, no matter how many pairs of shoes she bought that she hasn't wore the previous ones, that your love for her is consistent. You say, babe, if you completely destroy everything, I want to let you know, I'm going to love you till the end of life. When you do that, her shopping habits change. She changes. Everything changes. I realized one thing about marriage. Seven years of being married is that you don't love your wife because she's lovable. You usually love your wife because you're loving. The reason why you love your wife, it's not because she's easy to love. It's because you matured to love no matter how you feel and no matter what she does. 
my wife doesn't honor me because I'm easy to honor. My wife honors me because she's an honorable woman. If you think that your love on your wife depends on how she behaves, you're still yet to mature of what marriage is expecting of you. It's a boy that says, you treat me good, I treat you good. A man says, no matter how you treat me, I will love you. You may say, Vlad, but that's dangerous if I say that she's going to leave me. If that's what makes you feel loved, let it be. Does Jesus control us and say, well, if you leave me, I no longer will love you? We're afraid to go all out. But Jesus says, this is where our boyhood dies on the cross. Yeah. See, a marriage will kill a boy or a boy will kill a marriage. Wow. Somebody has to die. And typically the boy in us doesn't want to go on the cross. We guard that boy within us. Oh, we love to see Jesus on the cross. Real maturity is not when you gaze at the cross, when you get on one. Husbands, our marriage can be a heaven on earth if we die. Wives, your marriage can be a paradise if you die. If you die to your ego, if you die to my way or the highway, if you die to your own way, something will happen. I usually tell guys this, either marriage will die or two of you die to your selfishness, but somebody has to die. It's easier to kill the marriage than to kill your pride. It's easier to kill the marriage than to kill the pride, but I want to challenge you, man. Marriage is meant to develop our maturity and the way it develops our maturity, maturity is it kills the boy in us and we all have it. The crazy part with this little boy, it gets born every day. You deal, you deal with it today, tomorrow it comes up again. He's like, where, how did you find my address again? And he comes back and you got to keep nailing that. And that's how the marriage, now marriage is not gruesome and painful, but I am describing something that in order to live happy, everlasting, uh, how does the phrase say? Happily ever after. You have to put your flesh to death. Become more like Jesus. In order to be a man, I got to be like the Holy Spirit. In order to be a husband, I got to be more like Jesus. And there is one more stage to grow and that is to be a father. Number five, we graduate to be a father. So in order to be a man, I got to follow the Holy Spirit's conviction. In order to be a great husband, I got to follow Jesus' example, which is for me to, to die to my selfishness. And in order to be one more stage, which is the fatherhood of God, I got to develop a heart of a father. Now, a father, just because you have children, I know that technically you're a father. But in reality, that, that's not what fatherhood is. That's a title. The substance of fatherhood is not being able to produce a child because any guy can produce a child. Not any guy can take care of the child. It's taking care of the children, being there for the children, raising the children, not tapping out and saying that's not my kid and leaving somewhere else. But being there for the kid is really what the fatherhood is. It's always easier to make a child than to raise one. It's always easier to become a father than to be one. Can somebody say amen? Because see, in order to be a boy, boyhood is easy. To be a man is harder. To be a husband, it gets even harder. And then to be a father takes even more because now it's not only your wife that you love. It's not only your selfishness that you abandon, but also there's a little minion running in the house that looks up to you. And you recognize that this little human being, you brought it into this world and it carries your DNA. It's going to carry your habits and you got to watch on how you live. And that could really change your life because it requires something off of you but you can develop fatherly characteristics without having children George Washington who was the father of America never had children our Lord Jesus Christ didn't have biological children yet we call him according to Romans Abba father meaning Papa and so and he was 33 years of age when he left the earth and so what I'm saying is that every man sooner or later whether he has children right now or maybe the children grew up and you're an empty nester God wants you to develop within you a fatherly characteristics where you care for other people not just yourself this involves starting a small group this involves leading a bible study this involves finding somebody at work who can't pay the rent and saying listen i'm gonna help you this involves finding kids who maybe don't have parents and simply say you know what let me give you a little thing a thing or two about how to manage your finances how to do this god wants you to develop his nature which is to care for other people 
this is where the fatherly nature comes into i leave all the fathers with just one advice one thing that i pray for for each one of you to have a revelation that your presence can change your kids more than your presence one of the reasons why parents a lot of times give more presence to their kids than they should is because they want to compensate for the absence of themselves in the life of the kid real dad the best dad is not the one that kids run to when he has candies and presents it's when his hands are empty and the kids run to him God's existence didn't change me it's God's presence that changed my life what when we pray today when we worship today it's not because God exists that you were affected it's because God became present Emmanuel God with us your kids don't need your gifts as much as they need your presence that means when you come from work you are tired you're exhausted you want to get those 30 minutes and zone out and do whatever you want just nobody to talk to me and this is the moment where the kid brings that paper hey look this is the moment where they want to they want that time and we have to understand that if you don't give them your presence you will always later on in life will try to compensate with presents but they don't do the magic they can spoil the kids instead of actually help the kids because the way God did it to us he didn't bring us miracles he gave us himself and his presence changed our life maybe you are here in this room right now and you know that God exists but that doesn't change your life maybe you're even religious and you connect yourself with some kind of a Christian religion Christian Catholic Baptist Pentecostal whatever it is maybe you even come to hungry generation maybe you came here today for the first time to see somebody baptized or you just came visiting you heard a friend or you saw somebody's lives being changed I want to tell you something your life will change if you meet God and you welcome him into your life and you don't just rest with with the fact that he exists but you receive his presence in your life through this his son Jesus Christ and you repent of your sins church is not going to save you church is not going to get you to heaven there's only one thing that gets you to heaven his name is Jesus Christ he wants to forgive your sins today he wants you to walk out of this place knowing that your eternity is secure and he wants to change your life